Thanks for being a part of us this morning. If you're visiting, glad you've come. If you've been a regular attender and we haven't quite met yet, I'm glad you're coming and hopefully we can get to know each other. Uh, it is part of the goal of our fellowship. We've tried to explain this over last Sunday uh, uh, in, in re, uh, or undergirding and re-going over or reteaching uh, some of the philosophy that drives fellowship. So last Sunday's message was fo- foundational principles for fellowship. And this is that part too, but there's a subtitle of this that gives clarity to it. And last Sunday, under the foundational principles of fellowship, and when we say fellowship, we mean this church, uh, what makes Fellowship Baptist tick, what makes us do what we do. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can answer that, but last Sunday we handled three of four S's. Three of four S's. Last Sunday we talked about seeking Jesus, that's why we come. We come to see Him, come to worship Him come to glorify Him, even with the song that Pastor Phil was talking about, Arise, My Soul, Arise, and the idea of giving praise to God. This is, this is part of the medicinal um, work of the Holy Spirit through His Word that He does as the family of God comes together, that as we praise Him and find our joy in Him, it is mutually encouraging. So we seek Jesus, and then we desire to see Jesus in our fellowship. We desire to manifest Him one to the other. It really is our goal. Many times churches interpret this as, well, that church is really trying to be nice. And some churches, some people, when they attend church, they'd rather you not be nice and just get on with it. And that is the other, uh, some people don't really enjoy that more intimate fellowship time. And especially when you come here and you find that fellowship time elongated. Uh, Why is it that way? Well, the goal is to minister Christ one to another. The idea is that We really don't have anything good to offer within ourselves, but it is encouraging and a beautiful thing and uplifting when we can see Christ in one another. And then we encourage ourselves with a reminder that the goal isn't just to come and worship the Lord with our voices and to minister Christ by seeing Him amongst us, but also that the Lord would help us with one another to speak Jesus, to speak Him both in this place Now, we haven't even prayed yet, haven't gotten to the message yet, but as a way of going back to some of this teaching, uh, we would be foolish to think that everybody that comes here already knows who Jesus is and already has a redemptive relationship with Christ. Uh, So it's our goal that as we minister together, we'll have conversations about Christ, conversations about who He is and our relationship with Him for those that don't know Him invite them through discipleship to come to know the Jesus of the Bible who is worthy of every adoration and praise and gratitude that we can give. And all God's people said, so we want to speak him. We then turn to another foundational principle, and I would not say that these are all of them, but I left off last Sunday with the last S, and I wanted to give last Sunday's last S its day in the sun here Uh, again, because it is a theme that drives largely what we're doing, and that is serving Jesus. So seeking Jesus, seeing Jesus, speaking Jesus, and serving Jesus. And we're going to underscore through Scripture this morning what the Bible has to say about that, not in, in all that the Bible has to say, but some foundational passages that people who've come here for some time, you're familiar with, you know, you know we go there. Uh, But they underscore for us this morning what it means to serve Jesus. But I also want to say this, the importance of this message today, and I think maybe it does well for a moment, or we do well for a moment, to tell you again why I'm even doing this. We've stepped out of 2 Corinthians, took us a couple months to get through that. Um, But here we are uh, in between, and I think I know where I'm going on on our next series in the Bible. But in this moment of in-between, we also recognize that there are a lot of people who are new to fellowship uh, that don't know some of the driving doctrine that uh, gives us the exhibition of a ministry that we have. And we want you to know that we are not trying to come up with a ministry that, oh, that sounds like a good idea. We really are trying to follow what the scriptures teach. We're trying to model ourselves after what the Bible teaches. Uh, And I didn't really put this as a foundation, but that you will find it in our doctrines, in our, um, in our articles of faith, that the foundational principle of this ministry is that, I would say it this way, doctrine matters, but that foundation is 
the scriptures are our sole authority for faith and practice. So we look to the Bible. What does the Bible say? And I hope you'll experience this in this ministry that you will, I hope, recognize that we use the Bible. I, I do hope that you experience that. And I will say for a moment, uh, the reason I would say something like that is we often have people visiting with us and they will comment on the fact that it's, uh, that we use the Bible. And Pastor Phil and I pretty much have the same response every time. Well, what are churches doing that don't use the Bible? What are, exactly, what are they talking about? So with that in mind, then, I'll start you this morning with a very familiar passage. Take your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And let me tell you what it is I'm trying to do this morning. Yes, give the foundational principles, help you to know why we're doing what we do. But I also really am burdened that our people know and understand and come to know and come to understand better the path to ministry to take some of the mystery out of it, to take some of the, well, what do I do and how do I do this out of it? But at the same time, I'm going to underscore for you as a church family, administratively, the path that we are taking to try to accomplish this task of serving Jesus. This first principle, I haven't given them all G's, the first two happen to be, this first principle of Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 is going to be the principle of growing, the principle of growing. Now, I'm going to say it this way before we read the passage. Well, let's do it this way. I'm going to do it the other way. Let's read the passage. I'll illustrate and we'll come back and unpack it. We have Ephesians 4 in front of us. If you would read out loud with me, verses 11 through 16. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That is so packed, right? So much stuff that God has given us to know in that passage. When we were married, we, my wife and I, I should say even back before we were married, we had visions of, okay, those early questions of, so what do you think about children? And as if we had tons of experience, uh, outside of our siblings. What do you think about children? And I grew up with one sister. Uh, my sister's 10 months older than I am. Uh, and uh, she's five foot nothing. She's five foot two. And she's a stick of dynamite. She's a power packed person, always has been. And I owe a lot of any grit that I have to surviving my sister. Uh, and uh, she's watching... Uh, I love her greatly and thank the Lord for her, but we had a dynamic relationship growing up. Uh, my wife grew up with two sisters. She was in between them. And many times when you're talking about marriage, you have the context of your family and you don't know any better. Um, I knew my mom had eight and I, so I had six, I had six uncles and one aunt and then my mom. Uh, that was her family. But we talked, oh, we were like four or five kids and you know, who knows? Well, here we are with eight, and on this side of eight, the, those of you know my family, know that we have two girls, a boy, and then it went girls. And then there was a six-year gap in Joe, okay? And we were all surprised at Joe. When Joe came, all of us went, oh. <laughs> um, here's what I would say on that side of this. Now, you got your own opinion. I'm sure you do. But I will tell you, in my experience, it's easier to have girls first. And I'll tell you why. Uh, amen. I think, you're not going to like it. 
I think girls are more helpful than boys. <laughs> um, matter of fact, you know, some religions have a Mother Teresa. We have a Mother Jody that tells us that we're supposed to clean this place and take care of it and appreciate the announcement today. Uh, uh, I also find it very true that uh, very often young men tend to mature at a slower pace than girls. Now, I notice I'm getting a lot of good reaction from the ladies in the house. You guys are just kind of arm folded, yeah, whatever, buddy. Uh, but you and I both know we're in the club. We know. But here's the thing. Uh, when a child is growing up, there is for every family that growth in that child where you want to see them come to maturity. You want to see them start being a person who actually can help around the house. Maybe your family, Jody, talked about her kids liking to mow the grass. Some of you might remember those days when you were teaching your kids to mow the grass and, and, and thankful for the day where they could start learning how to do that and, and be helpful. It takes time. It takes time for them to grow to finally be at that age and be at that ability. But it's a natural result of growing. It's a natural uh, result of growing that we don't stay in the world of being takers and stay in the world of being served. And, and in our house, because we have the little guy, we're teaching him all the, time, all the time about even how to say things. When we're sitting at the table, just how to, how to even ask for food. He doesn't have it down real well. He, you know, many times he'll say, give me that. And we will try to recorrect and reteach. This is what it's like to ask. And purposely making him wait with me while everybody else goes first because it's not his instinct. Why? In his immaturity, he's very focused on me and very focused on what he wants. It's very natural to all of us. But if we stay there, we are not adulting well. If we stay there, we become a very unpleasant person to be around, an unpleasant person to interact with because it's not mature. Now, why is it not mature? It's not mature simply because it's outside of what society expects. It's not mature because God does not direct in the believer's life that we will operate in an existence outside of service. Our theology and understanding of God is that God is at work in all of his children to bring them to a place of maturity, to bring them to a place of service. Now, I also know for many of you, when you teach your young people to do something, it actually takes you twice as long at the front side to teach them. Are you with me? So you got to show them everything. You could have done it easier yourself. Uh, matter of fact, even unloading the dishwasher. Oh, the teaching sessions we've had of where things go and how you get them out and what happens if it drops on the floor and wash your hands before you unload and all the business that goes with it. Um, it takes time. But as you teach them, there comes a time where now they've got the instruction and then they can apply it in their lives and actually teach someone else how to do it as well. And I, I'm going to say something about parenting that maybe you'll agree with and maybe you won't. Uh, what size of family should you have? Well, obviously eight. No, I don't know. I don't know what size family you should have. But I will say 11. What I would say is this. And this is true. And my kids would say this, and, and I, I get it. The truth is the firstborn child has a different experience than the second. The secondborn child has a different experience than the third. The third has a different experience than the fourth. But I would tell you that the top three had a different experience than everybody else. Why? Because the top three then became co-disciple maker teachers for how we do what we do in the house and how to live and navigate in the house. They wound up teaching the other kids, this will get you in trouble. <laughs> this won't. Now you find out, all of us, right, find out things after our kids have grown that we didn't know while they were growing up. And my kids used to say, hey, there'd be a kid who would bark out with a cry. Why? Because they were personally offended at what another sibling did. And this would be typically someone, Bethany, would be the first to really receive something like this. But then she would have all three of the older siblings surrounding her with force when she wanted to cry, putting their hands over her face to mute her crying squeals. 
Knowing that if it continued, there would be the authoritative stomp of dad coming up the stairs. And sometimes the initiation would happen. The cries would stop and I would call out, what's going on? Oh, nothing. <laughs> so truly the top three did teach and helped teach the rest. It is actually a normal human experience, but spiritually it's true for you as well. That God is working in your life to grow you. And everybody's at a different place of experience and ministry and growth. And I would say that for many, without teaching on this, we can stay in a place of spiritual immaturity because we have not been challenged to examine our own ministry before the Lord. So that's what we're unpacking. He says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for a purpose. The purpose, in our language of the King James, it says for the perfecting of the saints. Most of you are students enough to the Bible. I will ask you, what does perfecting mean? It typically means the idea of being brought to maturity. It has the idea of one who was not equipped who has come to the full equipping of all they need with maturity to accomplish the task given them, whatever they may be. Now, this passage says, he gave these groups of people, or these people in verse 11, for this purpose, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, the clarification of doctrine, not assuming that everybody knows this, but some people coming from different denominations believe that a saint is something different than what the Bible teaches. A saint, to be short or concise about it, a saint is a believer in Jesus. That's, you're a redeemed child of God. So if you've come to faith in Christ, he calls you his child, he calls you a saint. And you often hear something like this, he calls you that, now act like one, right? Uh, but he calls us saints. He says, for the perfecting of the saints, this is why these people are given. And then he follows out what the maturity of the saints looks like. And what's the next phrase? So he calls these people for the maturing of the saints to what end? What does it say? All right, I expect you. I'm going to say it. You've got a Bible in front of you. He's given these people. Now you're in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. And your Bible says something after that. For what purpose? For the work of the ministry. Now I want to start by saying this. Eyeballs all here. We're all friends here. And I want to tell you something about church life. And I want to tell you something that I'm encouraged by. It is a proverbial statement that many have found true throughout church history. The statement is, has to do with percentages. Giving you a little clue. So you know where I'm going. 10% of people, they will often say, 10% of the people in church life often do 90% of the work. Now, I'm going to tell you, you with me? Everybody's eyeballs right here. That is not true at Fellowship Baptist Church. It is not true. It is not true, and I don't have the sheet in front of me. We work on this sheet together. Uh, it is an overview of ministry. And it does not entail all the ministries that we do here or that we have here. But we laid out this sheet so that everybody would know, well, if you want to minister in this way or in this area, here are people you can talk to about that. Uh, and it identifies the front and back. It's actually bled over into two sheets, now into three. And it is just laying out, hey, I want to know who do I talk to about that ministry? Who do I talk to about that? And it gives you a contact person to know, I want to know more about that and, and what can I know. I want to tell you something about that. That speaks of a mature people. And it really is all credit to your own growth in the Lord that it's not a 10% doing 90. But there really is a health here. And all of that health, I want you to know that if I was to stand fellowship up against the wall and do the measuring stick of your growth, you are not children. You are not immature. Many of you are, in, are marked on that line of growth with maturity. But we're all growing. We're all learning. But I think it's important to know that this is the litmus test of growth in this passage. 
that we are manifesting a life that is now turned from infancy in receiving to growing maturity of ministry. So that's what he says here. And it goes on that there's a natural outworking of this ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this is something that we've really taken a lot uh, into consideration in the nature of our Tuesday night discipleship night. And that is that our ministry not simply have the label of discipleship, but it also has the label of edification. For part of what we believe the ministry should be doing together when it comes together is building one another up in Jesus, encouraging each other in Christ and in our service. Now, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith, the unity of the faith is that everyone knows Christ, everyone's following Christ, everyone's going, growing in Christ, and everyone is serving Christ. This unity of the faith, it's all about Jesus. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, good doctrine here, knowing who Jesus is, knowing what Jesus expects, knowing what he's like and who he wants me to be. And here you have unto a perfect man, the one who is complete, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So out of this doctrine would flow, who should you be like? And in this doctrine, we lay out the application that the best standard for what you should be as a Christian is not the person beside you or in front of you or behind you. The best measure of what we're supposed to be is Christ himself and all God's people said. He is the target. He's the target. Every generation needs to settle this. Every generation needs to answer this. Every individual needs to come to this. That litmus test of what you should be doing or what you should be allowing in your life is not what other believers are doing. But who is Jesus and what is he like? Now, verse 14 has a doctrinal effect that in that growth in Christ and in that maturity in Christ that we henceforth be no more children, what? Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of now, doctrine. Now, I heard somebody tell me this this last week. I um, won't give the name here, but they told me this last week. They were talking to somebody, and they were trying to share with them Jesus. And they said, I don't want to hear about the Bible because people who talk about, about the Bible, all they're trying to do is indoctrinate you. And I would say, have you ever considered what they're doing in public school? Have you ever considered what they're doing on the news and in media? around you? What's happening in the world? Indoctrination. All over the place. The question is, which teacher are you listening to? Amen. Who are you listening to? Who are you going to follow? But you have a decision to make on who you're going to follow. And I want you to know that God's plan is a good plan because he loves you and he's growing you and he's working in your life and he's working in your life to grow you up to look like what you're going to be in the future when you finally stand before his presence. There's so much doctrine behind this, but the culmination is born out of the passage that Jason read this morning, Romans 8, that God has already seen it as good as done. For those that know Jesus, we're going to be changed to be looking like Jesus. Between here and there, that's the target. We're going to do it imperfectly, and we're going to mess up, but he's the target. Look like Christ. In verse 15, there comes some application out of this. Not only that out of verse 14 that we are kept away from false doctrine, but that we learn right doctrine from God. You know, and, and by the way, those of you that are blessed with little people, they're asking you all the time about doctrine. But it may not come in the form of, hey, dad or mom or grandma or grandpa, I need to know I need to know about this doctrine. But they will ask you all the time whether something is true or not, whether something is right or not. And so we are teachers pointing to the doctrine of the word, who God is, who truth is, or what truth is. But the way in which we do it matters. In verse 15, I'm going to tell you that I think a lot of Christians have gotten away from this and have not applied this doctrine in the way in which it's given. Verse 15, could you read it out loud? But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So do you need to speak the truth? That goes back to our previous essence. 
with me? But we need to speak the truth in love. And again, we can in our hearts give an amen to that. I will tell you, it's one of the things that I think about still in raising my children, still in raising my children. And that is to listen to myself talk to my family. To listen to the way in which I give guidance, directives, even commands about what we're supposed to do. Are you just the authoritarian saying right and wrong or do you look like Jesus? They don't always equal the same thing. You can speak the truth and still not look like Jesus. So he says the manner in which we do this is a manner that looks like love, loving people. Now, interesting, as we build further in verse 16, I use that word build because that's exactly what's happening in verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together, the idea of fitly joined together is kind of explained in the next few words and compacted by that which every joint supplies, the idea that every piece fits exactly as it should but as it should with efficiency. It says, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So the building of God's people, the building of the work of God happens as we learn how to minister together. But it's really important to learn what ministry then looks like. So all of Ephesians 4 that I'm giving you this morning is underscoring this point, that every person who is a child of God, God is initiating in your life a growth and a health that will lead you to several things. Underscoring from this passage, ministry. So here's my question. The amen of the Bible is so be it, let it be so, my heart agrees with that. What's important to me at this point, under laying out this first foundation, is the sentiment of your own heart. Is this my doctrine, or is this God's doctrine? And I want to know, does your heart give the amen to it? So I'll ask again, does your heart give the amen to this truth? This truth is for you. This truth is for me, every body. Now, often though, people will be stuck with, well, what does this look like? How does this live itself in my life? Take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going from growing to gifting. And I'm really answering the question, but what about me? Now, I have not given every passage that I will gonna, I'm going to use here, but I'm going to give passages that you know pretty well. What does the Bible say about you comparing yourself with somebody else? What does the Bible say about you comparing yourself with somebody else? The Bible says that it is not what? That it is not wise to compare yourself with somebody else. And it's because you're not somebody else, you are uniquely made of God. The unique you matters to the work of God. The unique you matters to the placement of God. We all can't be all places. We all can't do all things. We all can't handle everything that is needed in life. God made the body of Christ to work together to accomplish the work of God. But he made you specifically as an important part of that. We begin in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. So I don't want you to stay with a lack of knowledge and understanding how spiritual giftedness works. You know that the Gentiles were carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. The gospel in that is if it wasn't for Christ, we would be following dumb idols. If it wasn't for Christ, we'd be as lost as anybody is lost. Verse 3, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, gifts and, <clears throat> but it is the same Spirit. 
There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. The diversities word means what? What does diversities mean? It just means there are differences. There are differences of different areas of administration and operation, but it's God who's working in the midst. Now, a big time out here, and especially, I know this is true, uh, there, honest, honestly, if, it's part of what many Christians do. They, they wonder, you know, does God want to use me? And then we start exploring what are my spiritual gifts, and you can actually take spiritual gift tests online, and, and, and now you can qualify what your gift is, and, and then sometimes you say, well, I don't have that gift, I want to get that gift, so I'm going to go to a class and get that gift. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he has gifted you. And you're going to bear that out as we keep working forward. It says in verse 7, the revelation of the Spirit's working, the manifestation of his working, is given to every man to profit with all. So who gives the giftedness that people have? Who gives the giftedness that people have? You guys are either tired, had a hard week, but you are like way back yonder. Come here with me. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Some of you are like, no, I'm Joe. I'd rather be back in bed. <laughs> I, I get it. Thanks for being here anyway. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge to, by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles. <clears throat> to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Everybody, verse 11 out loud. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. He gives to every one, how? As he wills. Now, who is he doing this to? Everyone who's his child. He's equipped you to serve by nature of being his child. And what I'm addressing right now is the idea that there's nothing you can do because you don't have any giftedness. Doctrinally, that is incorrect. Amen? It's not true. But what happens is you start comparing yourself with somebody else. You start looking at what they do. And we often follow those things with, well, I could never. And it's true that you may never be able to do what somebody else is doing, but that doesn't mean that you're not gifted to serve God. He divides, he imparts as he will. Verse 12 through 14 out loud with me. Verse 12 through 14 out loud. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. All right. <clears throat> There's a lot of doctrine that flows out of this. And the doctrine is underscoring God and the first principle, God is it work in every believer's life to mature you to a place of ministry? All right, so are you with me? Everybody's here, eyeballs are here, we're together in this. God did not bring you here today just to hear and know something. And I'm convinced that churches all across America are closing their doors because, and I've, I've heard it so many times, we've got a good faithful Bible teacher, and I'm very bold about this, and, and it may take some apology or grace for you to even hear it, but I've come to saying that preaching the Word of God is not enough. The reason it's not enough isn't due to the insufficiency of the Scriptures. The Scriptures are sufficient. But when we don't do what the Word says... I believe the Lord is snuffing out those candles to find one that will do. It's really what's leading us to where we're going next as a church in our Bible studies. But you have to 
reconcile truth to your life. Number one, that God is maturing you, growing you to service. Number two, that he's growing you as an individual with the giftedness that he gave that you be a part of the work of God. You. And what I'm doing with that point doctrinally, biblically, is taking away from you all of that powerlessness that you will live with that I'm not like somebody else. I don't have giftedness. I don't have ability. There's nothing I can do. And I'm just lost in the world and accepting this is the reality. When it is doctrinally not correct. Not only is it doctrinally not correct, but it's very unhealthy. What would happen to you if you, this happens when we go to pastor's retreat, Samantha, let's say what you said. Samantha got a load of our schedule or got a hold of our schedule when we, the pastors and Cameron, went to a pastor's retreat. She looked at the schedule. She said, I'm going to paraphrase this first part of it. She said, they're eating all the time. <laughs> now, really the way she said it more loosely or a little, little clearer, well, she said, it looks like they're meeting and eating and meeting and eating and meeting and eating. <laughs> all right, folks. What happens if all you do is meet and eat, meet and eat, meet and eat? It's okay to say that word out loud. What happens? You get fat. Why? God did not make you just to receive. Hello? He did not make you just to receive. He made us to receive and do. And I'm saying, really, we have a lot of fat churches that are dying. They got truth. We haven't found a way to do it. And what I'm trying to do, Pastor Phil, what we're trying to get to as a place here, and you're going to hear about it, is that we are trying to make sure that we are grounded in doctrine, clear in presentation with what that path looks like so that Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 and the rest of it can happen so that people know how to engage in ministry as you grow in Christ. Some people incorrectly believe that, that the work of the church is bound to the pastors. I will tell you that there are many churches where that is true. And it's often based on size. There's only 20, 30 people there, and the pastor really is doing the lion's share of what happens. But if the, if the church grows, I'm just saying there's only so much any one person can do. And by nature, the church is self-limiting because pastors... We're not made to do it all. And pastors have lost their way in the understanding of doctrine. And that is, we are not expected to do it all. We're expected, I often describe it this way. I describe myself as one who holds a machete. And machete is to be used when somebody is led of God to do ministry, to use that machete to help clear the path so they can accomplish the ministry that God has called them to. So we're just working alongside, clearing the path, making the path to ministry known and doable. I need, I need some keys. I need three sets of keys. I don't have mine. You got keys on you? Keys. I need keys. Or, or I'll take a wallet. Keys are better. <laughs> keys are better. I need three sets of keys. Oh, a big set. I'll take it. I'll take it. One. Oh, two. Oh, three. So what can you do? I have three cars for sale. Is, no. <laughs> no, I'm not taking your car. All of us have giftedness that we can handle. Some of us have giftedness that we have where we're holding this one thing, we're tossing this one thing, and it takes everything that we can do to handle that one thing. And we keep handling that one thing, and then sometimes we find that we have more things that we can handle. And we take them, and oh, now it starts to get a little insecure. i got to handle two things. And in those two things, can I handle them well? It depends. Not everybody has two hands. Not everybody has even any eye-hand coordination, and all they can handle is that one thing. But then there are people, and oh, here we go. There are people that can do some of that.
Now, I stopped after two seconds because that's about what I can do. And it was a miracle that I could do that. I don't know whose keys they are, but thank you. But what you learn is that you throw another set in there, and there are people who have the giftedness to carry another. There are people that have the giftedness to carry another. I'm going to say it out loud. Be, you'll be uncomfortable with it. This is Beth Crail. Beth Crail, I think she's, she's very gifted to handle. I've never seen Beth not able to handle anything I've ever thrown her way. I could use a lot of your names this way. Very often, many of you feel just like I do, that it's that one thing. And it's like, man, that takes everything I got. It takes everything I got just to hang on to that one thing and to focus on that one thing. What I'm saying for some of us is that we're not even in the game. We're not even in the participation. And that is not what God has made you to be. Now, that's, that can sound to you very oppressive until you hear more doctrine. So, there then comes the principle of following. Found in Philippians chapter 2. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2. And I've got to move along here because of time. I hope you get your cars back. If you don't, it might be a chance to get a different car. Pastor Phil would be glad <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 just tells us this in verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Now, folks, this is, an, this is an obedience kind of thing. This is not a teaching where God says, hey, I want you to know something only, but he actually says there's something to be appropriated to your life. Let this mind in verse 5 be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a and was made in the likeness of men. Now, what did servanthood look like in Christ? And being found in fashion as a man, he... And being found in fashion as a man, he... All right, so what you're hearing me do... <laughs> I'll steal a little bit from Pastor Minnick. I'm doing it here too. Uh, Pastor Minnick was... Um, he's the guy that taught at our pastor's retreat. Um, but he said he was referring to the Bible... And he asked the people to look at the Bible. And when he looked out, they were still looking at him. And he said, I actually got irritated. And, I, and he said, probably not as grace-filled as he would like. He said, look at your Bibles. <laughs> and when I ask you the questions to fill in the blank, my heart's desire is if you don't know the answer, that you will go to the Bible. And see that it's not my doctrine, but the Word of God. That says, mine being you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, and took upon him the form of a ser servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found as a fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And in that humility became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It goes on that God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's interesting to me that in the doctrine of the gospel what you have at its core is servanthood. Isn't that interesting? At the core of the doctrine of the gospel is the doctrine of servanthood. You even have this later. I don't remember if I put it in my notes or not. Um, you find it in John. Where Christ is washing the disciples' feet. And this is after they're, you know, these guys are jostling who's going to be most important. It's John 13, that I, John 13 verse 15. I've given you an example that you should do as I've done unto you. And what's the example? The example is to humble ourselves and be servants. It isn't about glory it isn't about name. It isn't about, uh, you know, the Cleaver Bible Institute for Further Education or the, the Estes Emporium, whatever an emporium is. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it isn't about name. If it is about name, it's about one name. And what name is that? Yeah, Jesus Christ. 
It's about him. Now, folks, we're gathering here today. I don't know how many people. And I will tell you that I wish everybody that comes to fellowship was able to be here right now. Because I want everybody to know this message. And to know that God has a place for you to serve. I'm going to say something else pretty fundamental about servanthood. You don't even have to be a part of a church to be a servant of Christ. You don't have to be a member of a church to serve Jesus. Now, do I think you should? Yeah. But so core to who you are as a believer that being a member of a church isn't even, you know, on the list of of necessities. It's healthy. But God equips you to serve when you're put into the body of Christ, baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. But there has to come a point of choosing. For this, I turn, I know these are a little bit hot spots here as far as taking some passages, but I go back to Joshua of making a choice. It's Joshua 24 verses 14 and 15. There's a lot of doctrine behind this. I don't think it's inappropriate to the context of our message this morning. But John 24, 14 and 15, I'll read it for you. He says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, you know this next phrase, choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, you know the phrase, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Have you made that choice? I'm going to ask it directly again. Have you made that choice? Now, folks, I'm with you, and I know this is very, like, um, pointed, but I'm going to say it again. It's very easy for us to affirm the choice, but still, still live outside of the do. It's very easy. But now I want to say for you in the time that we have left, the path to ministry that is built on doctrine. So you ready? Here it is. The path of ministry built on doctrine is, number one, if you're a child of God, he's already made you a servant of Christ. He's already made you a minister. He's already given you ability to serve. And all God's people said. Amen. Secondly, in that giftedness, it means that particularly he has gifted your life to be able to do whatever he's called you to do. Now, I appreciate it. And I understand it. And it's not, I'm not condemning this. But many times on the front side or in seeking ministry, we will often go to someone and say, like a pastor or a deacon or someone else and say, I'd like to serve. Can you, can you give me an area of service? Now, I think there are times when that's true. There's times when that's very appropriate. <clears throat> it's Jody saying, this is how you can do it here. There are spider webs on the wall. If they're going to come down, it's not going to be magic. Right? You ever seen that? You ever seen that funny little video? There's a husband who, whose wife is irritated. And she's irritated because of the mess that's all over the house. And she's complaining about that. And, and, and he's, he steps up uncomfortably to her and he says, well, I didn't want to tell you this because I didn't want to jinx it, but I... I want to tell you what happens. He said, there are times when I will leave things on the coffee table like a pizza box and a Coke can and and I will get up in the morning and it's gone. And he said, you know, I did that for a while and it's like, I don't know how that's happening, but there's got to be like some kind of special power in the house. And he said, "So, so I started testing it. I started leaving things everywhere. And you know what I found? It all got put away. And of course, the wife, well, you know, it'd be a good time to have a rolling pin, right, to hit the guy. But everybody's gifted to serve 
as God has gifted you, but now how does that happen? So how it happens predominantly is through the Holy Spirit leading in your life. He is the best one to tell you how to serve. He is the best one to guide you in what that service looks like. Sometimes that service is going to be prayer. Sometimes it's going to be reaching out to another brother or another sister. Sometimes it's going to be reaching out to the lost. Sometimes it's going to be reaching out to a neighbor. Sometimes it's going to be playing in the orchestra. Sometimes it's going to be singing in the congregation. Sometimes it's going to be coming up to another brother or sister in the Lord who's struggling. And your ministerial life says, I am going to build them up. I'm going to encourage them in Christ. The truth is, once I start going down the road of how to serve, we, ought to, we automatically start self-limiting our, ourselves. But when you lean on the Holy Spirit to guide how you serve, you will find there are more areas to serve than you can handle. Everybody's not the preacher. Everybody's not the Sunday school teacher. Everybody's not a deacon. But as a child of God, you are made to serve. And you can and I will tell you with joy that there are many ministries that are either on our sheet or that have started in this church, and I did not start them. Each one of those ministries at some point has coordinated with me, but I did not lead them, and I also don't even attend all of those ministries because our people are serving as God has directed them. There are Bible studies, there are coffee fellowships. There are ladies fellowships. There are times where you're getting together and you're, you've identified somebody that needs to grow in Christ and you've opened the door to say, hey, would you like to do a Bible study? That's happening right now by people who are being led of the Holy Spirit to serve as God directs. So what you need to know is that God is growing you to ministry. He's equipped you to ministry and he will lead you into ministry. So the last thing then in all of this, I want you to understand the path of ministry and fellowship, and it may take a moment here. But here, here's the thing again that I'm concerned about. I am concerned that we not become a church that affirms the truth without the application of the truth. I'm concerned that there are things that we say we believe, but we put no effort into doing. And so, there are several things, and this is just pastoral talk right now, that will help you understand some of the ministry at fellowship. For some time now, it's been a burden of our hearts that our young people, as they grow up through this ministry, that they get trained in ministry. And let me tell you the scope of that passion. It's Ephesians 4, it's 1 Corinthians 12, it also has with it the desire coupled with that, that no young, people, young person graduates from high school out, out of this ministry without being trained in ministry. In other words, I don't want the first time that they are approached about teaching a Sunday school class or helping with a vacation Bible school or doing graphic arts for church or doing uh, crafts in church or helping in some way puppets. I don't want the first time that they do that to be when they've left this ministry. If that's the case, all we've done is teach and teach and teach and not accomplish Ephesians 4. We have a ministry that we partner with, MTT, Make a Timothy Today. It's such a good partnership because we're going in the same direction. But I'm going to tell you something about MTT. I, I, I don't want to be proud about it, <laughs> but I also do not want our kids going to serve on MTT to serve in a way that they haven't been taught yet at fellowship. In other words, when they go, it might broaden their horizon, but I want them to have already learned how to serve in this ministry. And I will tell you that I think one of the problems that we have today in ministerial life in churches is that we've divorced ourselves from the applicational truth of these passages we have not engaged in the process, and as a result, we've raised young person after young person that hasn't been brought to maturity in service, and no wonder 
when they graduate from high school and leave, that there is no connection to either service or the local church. They are simply living out what they've learned. Now, we believe this so much that we're actually trying to open the door. And let me just tell you the path. First through, actually, nursery through sixth grade often is very much a teaching-oriented kind of ministry. Once they hit seventh grade, that ministry changes. We start incorporating those young people in vacation Bible school, <clears throat> start incorporating them into chimes, into music ministry, into service ministry, and then it grows from there and going on mission trips within our body and then going on mission trips with MTT so that they have the opportunity to grow in ministry. And now what we're trying to do is open that door to go down from sixth grade and below. So we're trying to find and start to open the door of how to invite those younger people into ministry where they identified as ministry. And I will tell you very often that group has a very great heart to serve. So we're trying to explore how we do that. But I'm going to tell you folks, this is also why we have an internship program. Now, a big time out, I know what time it is, but I, I want to commend you and I want you to hear this out. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you something. Do you think I believe what I'm teaching you? So is there any confusion on that? Do you think I believe it? Okay. I want to add another question for you. Do you think Pastor Phil and I both believe it? Do you think that we are targeting this within our body? So I want to commend you about something. It's one thing for a pastor to come before his people, God's people, and to point them to things that we should be doing. Now, I'm going to underscore before I finish the story, but I'm going to come back to this. If churches aren't training people for ministry, who is? You might say the family, and that would be a good answer, but the family works in coordination with the administration of a local church. That's the design that God set up. But we partner with that. We point towards that. But it's one thing to come before God's people and to say these things. And it's another thing to have God's people get behind it. So I want to tell you the fruit of that in very tangible terms. So what I come before you and I tell you, I believe doctrinally and show you that I believe doctrinally that it is a responsibility of the church to be training ministers of the gospel, to be training servants of the Lord. And now we're going to administratively develop a plan to do so by pulling in interns, by pulling in people, not to mention everything that I've already said about what we're doing and reaching in our own ministry. But we're going to do this, and it's going to take some finances to do it. There, I'm going to tell you that there are plenty of pastors who would teach this, and at the end of the day, they have taught it, they've spoken to it, and they don't have partnership with their people, and now there's really tangibly nothing they can do further because the people have not engaged in the process. And what that means for us is this. You guys, in just one way, you guys have given financially to make it possible for us to train people in ministry. Did you know? Do you understand that? And sometimes in Christianity, people have divorced themselves from the truth of it actually takes finances to get something done. And very often, we would have put young people going into ministry in a place of saying, I've either got to choose to earn money for school, or I go serve an internship, or I go serve at camp. And the takeaway is, you're not going to make any money doing it, and now you're going to have to stay out of school. And it's going to delay your education, maybe stop your education. And you guys, this is the progression that you have done. We went from having one intern in 2018 with Brandon Teske. The next year to underscore the fact that the church is where this needs to start is the fact that we could not even find an intern, even going to Bible colleges, we could not find an intern the next year. And then God blessed, and the next year we had two interns. That was Jace Kassoon and Titus Houston. 
And then in that year, just catch this, it's really a four-year process, but in that year, God opened the doors because of how you participated, and God opened the doors so that we went from having two interns locally to actually participating in training six different interns, really, nationally and internationally. So we had two, Jace and Titus, and God blessed that at the end of that, we had Nathan Ellison, someone from our own ministry, who was our first nine-month long-term intern. And then we partnered with a ministry in Bend, Oregon, partnered with another ministry in Queens, New York. And where was the other one? The Philip Latin, Latin America. It's um, Brother Andrew Counterman. So we went from participating in two ministers, two people being trained in ministry, to six. Something else that happened when we started teaching this and started going down this road is that we were blessed as a ministry to identify within this body and an age spectrum. I'm not talking about just teenagers, but adults, teens alike. We had nine people that were identified as saying, I am surrendered and willing to be in full-time ministry. Nine people that we didn't know about going in that direction. No shocker that God builds ministerial training in the local church. The fruit of that today (coughs) is that we participated in internships this summer. And then last night you got an email telling you that Cameron Spencer has surrendered a full-time ministry, is going to be serving as an intern from within this church family. Added to that, you have Pastor Andrew and Lydia Stringfellow who have surrendered to ministry and are in this ministry actively serving in training. And I want to tell you that every step along the way, it's a step of faith. We've never been there before. We've never done that before. But I want to tell you something. We, we could not do what we are doing in trying to train people for ministry if it wasn't for you. And I believe this is what healthy church looks like. It's getting to a place of not just seeing God wants us to do this, but actuating the step to do it. Now, to be clear, for everybody visiting here, you might get the idea of, boy, listen to them tout their... uh, Uh, blow their own horn. I want you to know something. We are not everything that we need to be. We are deficient. We always need the Lord's help, always need the Lord's direction. But I am thankful for the partnership that we share together. And by God's grace, I want to see it grow. Now, I'm not talking about numbers. I do think it's a natural result. But I'm not really worried about the numbers. I'm really concerned that we each be growing in our service to the Lord. That you would pursue what has the Holy Spirit led you to do. Ask that question in your devotional life. Ask that question in your ministerial life. Lord, how can I be used of you? And can I encourage you? Just surrender to and follow him. Can we get an amen on that? Now, I'm going to end with something that was said in staff meeting by Pastor Phil. I was presenting some ministerial ideas and thoughts, and I asked for their opinion. And Pastor Phil Phil said, it's time to go to the Nike slogan. And so you know what that is. And if you know it, we'll say it together. What is it? Just do it. And that's what the church needs to be doing. Get to the work of God time is short. The need is great. We have the gifting of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's do it.